in Parshat Truma. So it's going to be all about the Mishkan and the utensils and everything else. And everybody wonder, you know, the, the kind of, it's no longer stories. How, how interesting could it be? You know, it's absolutely fascinating. Totally fascinating. Because if obviously if, if God said, how to, if God said to, to build a Mishkan and make utensils, so obviously he had stuff in mind. So it's, it's remarkable. The, 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 it's remarkable what you're going to find here. Okay? So first of all, Daber Hashem al Moshe Lemor. Daber el Bene Yisrael, page 444. 444. Daber el Bene Yisrael, the Ikhuli Truma. They shall take for me a Truma donation. Me es kol isha shayid venalibo tikhu es Trumasi. From every person whose Truma, whose heart so inclines him, you should take my Truma. 444. 444. For those of you who came late, we're starting at 1210 every day. Starting for, I moved it to 1210 as opposed to 1250. It says on the schedule 1250, but it's 1210. The, uh, um, so we're starting over here now on uh, the building of the Mishka. Now before anything else, there's a fundamental dispute among the commentaries. Was the Mishkan a Hayakov? Was the Mishkan Lichat Chila? That means there was always going to be a Mishkan. Or is the Mishkan only a response to the golden calf. There are different opinions among the Rishonim, there are different opinions among the Rishonim, whether this is any way was going to be like this, or this is only a response to the golden calf, which actually takes later. But there's a rule in Torah, Ein mukta vein mu'uchar batorah. There's no chronological order to the way things are reported in the Torah. Sometimes things are reported in the text, they're reported out of the order that they actually took place. Or as according to some, this takes place after Moshe, after the, the incident with the golden calf. Be that as it may, the, the, the Mishkan, which is, the Mishkan, which is uh, 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 built, the, what they call it, they translate it the tabernacle, the, uh, the Mishkan, we're going to find five parshas. The better part of five parshas are going to describe, are going to talk about the Mishkan, right? which is this little uh, tent-like uh, 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 thing that they build somewhere in the desert. Now what's remarkable is, it's remarkable is that if you look at creation of the world, the creation is 31 psukim. That means the world, with its billions and trillions of stars and people and plants and animals and life, that's 31 psukim. Then you get to this little Mishkan over here, and this little Mishkan is going to be described in graphic detail in, 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 over, over the course of five parshas. So that tells you, that gives you an idea. Well, the world, what was the world created for? Right? What was the world? The world was created for man. The big world, the whole, the whole big world over there. The more the world is created for man. How much of the, how much of the Torah talks about man? You know, a little bit talks about man in general, a couple of parshas. And after it talks about man in general, then what do you get? Then you get the Jewish people. Boom. So it's kind of an inverse and, and, and it, 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 it is the, the smaller the thing gets, the bigger, the more discussion there is. The biggest thing is the world. I mean, the world's massive. The world's massive. I mean, it's pretty big anyway. Uh, you know, I mean, Israel isn't that big. But, uh, uh, you know, Israelis think it is. You know, Israelis compare Israel to America. You know, America, I got news for you, buddy. You know, <laughs> a long trip in Israel is two and a half hours up to Tzvass. You know, there's, ooh, we made a trip, you know. In America, you can fly six hours in an airplane from one end to the other. You know, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's longer coast to coast in America than it's from Israel to England. You know, just to keep it in a proper perspective, Israel to England is four, four and a half hours. Right? Depending on which way you got. America, from, from New York to California, is at least five and a half hours. At least five and a half hours. And, gives you, and there's a big world out there. Then you get to, then you get to Russia. <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of Russia out there. There's a lot of Afghanistan out there. Yeah. So, but that's 31 psukim, the whole thing. Then you get to outer space and the, the sea, 31 psukim. Here you got a Mishkan, five, five parshas talk about a Mishkan. Why? Because obviously the focus is this Mishkan, because the Mishkan represents service of God. That's what it's all really coming down to. So the Mishkan is a type of service of God, but it is all, this, this is where it's all coming down to, and therefore there's more discussion about the Mishkan than anything else. Now if you take a look at that pasuk, you should immediately have a question. Speak to the Bnei Israel, Dabri Bnei Israel, Vyikhuli Truma. They shall take for me a Truma. What bothers you about that, Ali? Take for me a Truma. Anything bother you about that? A Truma is a donation. 
A true one is a, is a donation. How's the arts go translate it? If you're donating it, you're giving it. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Take for me, it sounds like my, sounds like if you ever grandparents came from Europe, that's how they used to say, take me an orange. Yeah, that's how they said, take, take for me an orange. Right? That's like, because they, they translated, often they translated direct translation from, from, the, from the Yiddish or from whatever the German, whatever language it was, they translate into English, but the, the verbs, uh, you know, it, it, it moves in, in a different, uh, they, they, in German, in German, the verb, the verb comes at the end of the at the end of the sentence. They say to the to the store down the block I will go. As I, in, in, if you I mean it translated from from the, I think Mark Twain was once who was it? Mark Twain said he was once at a play, a play in German, and he got up and he walked out after a half hour. They said to him, "Why did you walk out after a half hour?" He says, "I was waiting for the verb." <laughs> That's what Mark Twain said because it was a play in German, something like that. So, 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 so here, that's, that should call your attention to it right away. The equally truma, they shall take for me a truma. So it, when you get to truma, first of all, you get into, what is a truma? Truma, you ask, you ask the, uh, what, what is a truma? A truma means you're donating something. And when we talk about donating, we're talking about tzedakah. Okay, now, when, when you take something, the yikhuli truma, the Jewish people, and then the Torah is going to go on to describe the girls are going to go on to describe the raw materials that they're going to be donating. Guys who came, guys who came in a little a few minutes late, we're going to be starting at 1210. We're going to start at 1210 every day. I moved it back five minutes. So I have to get it on the schedule. So when you take, there are times in life when you, ta- when you give, but you're actually taking. One of those times of life is tzedakah. You give tzedakah, but you're actually taking. How so? Because A, when you give tzedakah, you are taking because you're going to be rewarded in the world to come. You get, you get reward. So when you give, you're actually taking. When you give tzedakah, by, 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 by bringing it to me, by giving it to me, God, God owns everything, by giving it to me, is in, in fact, they're actually going to be taking. Because by giving the tzedakah, you're going to be getting rewarded. I heard about a guy once who used to give a lot of tzedakah, and, and people, that guy gave a lot, a lot of money away. And somebody said to him, why are you giving so much money away? He said, I'm just smuggling my money into Olam Haba. <laughs> yeah, cause you're in this world, you don't take nothing with you. You know, in, in this world, you know, they bury you, they bury you, and then your kids fight over the, over the inheritance. That's all that happens. And in the world to come, you know, if you give the staka here, then that goes with you, that goes with you into, into, in, into the Olam Haba. That's number one. Number two is the way tzedakah works, I've mentioned this in the past, that, that y- y- the way tzedakah works is it's counterintuitive. I told you, the guy goes into the, guy goes into the post office and he brings a package. So the guy says, to him, that package is too heavy, you have to put more stamps on it. He says, yeah, but that's going to make it heavier. Right? So some things in life, yeah, well, I understand if it's too heavy, it's going to make it, yeah, but it works, it works slightly differently. Because the more tzedakah you give, then there's a Rebona Shalom who sees that you're giving money away, so he gives you more money because he's looking for people to help distribute. If you're a good distributor, if you're a good distributor, the Rebona Shalom is going to give you more money to distribute. If you're not a good distributor, the Rebona Shalom takes it away from you. So if a person, for example, I'll get you one second, yeah, if a person take, gives 10% of his money, if let's say you earn $100,000 a year, you give 10% of your money, Coach Rebona says, wow, you're good, I like that, I've been waiting for somebody because I need a distributor, so I'll give you another 100000 the next year. Then you do it again. He says, you're consistent. You know what? I'm giving you 200000 So you give away four, You give away 20000 He says, I like your attitude. And actually gives you another 200000 And this time you decide, you know what? I'm going to upgrade it. I'm going to go up to 20%. And you give away $40,000. So he says, ooh, you I've been waiting for. You I've been waiting. Then he drops half a million bucks on you. Half a million bucks. I give away $100,000. He says, oh, you're a star. The next year he gives you a million. A million? That's 200000 Whoa, that's some serious scratch, you know. I don't know if I'm going to give away 200000 I'm going to cut it down to 100000 Bad, 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 bad. <laughs> bad. Wrong attitude, that Kosh Rocha cuts you. Oh, I had a bad year. I only had 500000 this year. Kosh Rocha cut me. I should have such a bad year. I had a bad year. I had only had 500000 Kosh Rocha says, oh, 500000 I can't even give 10%. I'm going to give 5%. Ooh, bad, bad, bad. Next year, you take a loss. Because what you give, you give. That's why yikhuli truma. When you take, when you give to truma, when you give tzedakah, so by giving, you're actually going to end up getting. What are we going to ask? I was going to say that uh, with that 20% you might 
get clever and think I'm going to give 30 and 40 percent, then uh, you can't. There's a limit. The reverse happens There's a limit. Yeah, There's a limit. The, 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 the limit. The limit. The limit is the the Gemara says the limit is 20 yeah, percent. Yeah. The limit is 20 percent. The only time you can give more is there are two situations where you can give more. If you're giving because you uh, want to fulfill the Torah command of giving tzedakah, you're limited to 20%. But let's say somebody in the family isn't well, or let's say a guy's looking for a shidduch, or let's say guys, and you want, to, you want in the merit of the tzedakah that your relative should be cured, then you can give as much as you want, as Chafetz Chaim says. You give even more than 20%. If you're doing it just to fulfill the mitzvah, you're limited to 20%. The reason Gemara says is because if you give away too much, then you're going to make yourself needy. Then one second, one second, hold, 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 one second. Then you're going to make yourself needy. But if you give it before a specific person, that in the merit of this, this relative should get well, that the Chafetz Chaim says you're allowed to, what's the logic? What's the logic? The logic is because if the guy was, if, 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 if the relative was, if you needed a doctor, you'd pay everything for a doctor. For this guy to get well, you'd pay more than twenty percent for that. No limit on how much you'd pay a doctor. So I'll pay the I'll pay the rebbonu shalom as the doctor. I'll give him I'll give more money, and in the merit of this money, he should be cured. That's already a different type of tzedakah. That's one that's one category. I just heard a story about just saw a story about a guy. There was a kid who was sick. Very, 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 the kid was very very sick, and uh, they needed uh, a, there was a, only one doctor who could do the treatment, and the cost of the uh, the cost was going to be one hundred and thirty thousand dollars, and the family was they didn't have the money, and one of his relatives, one of the relatives, sold their apartment. Here in Israel, they sold it for cheap. They sold it just to get the one hundred and thirty thousand dollars, so they could fly in this doctor from the United States, non-Jewish doctor. You could fly in this non-Jewish doctor from the United States in order to do the surgery. People do anything for the surgery. So what happened was the doctor, the Jewish doctor flies in from the United States. In the meantime, there was a cab driver. And this cab driver found like a, 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 an attache case in his, uh, in his cab. And he opened up the attache case and it's got some weird equipment in it. It turned out that the doctor who had flown in from the United States ended up, and he ended up leaving his equipment, which was, which he had spent years designing special equipment because only he could do the surgery, he left it in the cab. And the cab driver, the cab driver returned it, somehow the cab driver gave it back to the family, they brought it back to the doctor, and the doctor said, that, you know, this is amazing, it cost me $40,000, that stuff, you know, I, I, I kissed it goodbye already, that was years of work, I was very upset. And then he said to the cab driver, you know, why, why are you bringing it back? And they guess somehow the cab driver knew the kid that he was doing the surgery on, so the doctor waived his fee. The doctor waved his feet, and in the meantime, the couple, the brother and sister-in-law who had sold their apartment in order to pay for the surgery, so now they're without an apartment. So they were walk, taking a walk in Yerushalayim, and also they saw a for sale sign on a bigger apartment than they owned. And they knocked on the door, was the cab driver. And the cab driver said, yeah, I'm selling this, I'm selling my apartment, but it's $300,000 because I found I inherited a villa somewhere out in the north of the country. So they said, well, we haven't got $300,000. He said, oh, one second, you're the brother. So you gave up your apartment to save your brother's life. You know what, just give me whatever it's worth to you, and you can have your apartment. So everybody lived happily ever after. Right? But the point is that you, would, that you would give up, you would spend anything. There, that's one category of where you could break the bank, where you could go more than 20%. The other category is if you're mega rich. If you're mega rich, you could give more than 20%. How much is mega rich? If you got to ask, you're not. That's the rule, right? If you if you gotta ask, then you're, then I, and that's one of the shilas I would like to ask one day. I would like to have to ask a posek instead of asking the posek, do I have to say Shmon Esrei over because I forgot Yala Yavo my third time around, right? I would like to be able to ask, am I considered mega rich, and I could give more than twenty percent, or I'm not mega rich yet? I'm waiting to ask that shaila. That is what the the the, the, the vehicle truma number one. Number two. Somebody had a question. Somebody, somebody had, yeah, go ahead. I understand giving money to another person, but like here it's giving to Hashem, Hashem is everything. So how is it like it's giving a donation to Hashem? Like, do you ever give money to a shul? <coughs> yeah, do you ever give money to a shul? Shul's not people. Shul's sitter. A shul is, is painting the walls. A shul is upkeep. That's giving money to Hashem. You're building to Hashem. Sometimes that's even harder. Sometimes it's even harder for people, at least, you know, at least I could help people. Sometimes giving money to the shul is not so simple. I want to tell you something else about giving money. This is very important. 
there was a uh, there was a very wealthy man who wanted to make a donation. I want to make a donation. It's an extremely important point, gentlemen. He's a very wealthy man who wanted to make a donation. I don't know all the background. He was Russian. He had some sort of Russian background. So he went to a rov, and the rov said to him that. Uh, the guy said, listen, I want to I wanna do something good with my money. Maybe I'll build a shul for the Russian community. He said, I got a better idea for you. Instead of building a shul, I want you to buy matzahs on Pesach for the Russian community. Did I tell you this last time? I want you to buy matzahs on Pesach. You know how much matzahs cost for Pesach? Hand matzahs in Israel could cost about 150, 200 shekels a kilo. I made a calculation one year at the Pesach Seder. Where, where you my, what's that? I made a calculation one year that, that, that the matzah, my, my hand matzah, costs 35 cents a bite, which is why it's called poor man's bread. Right? <laughs> it costs me 35 cents a bite. And my four-year-old sitting at the Pesach Seder crumbling up some matzahs. Hey, kid, not that. Now take, my, take mommy's jewelry. Not that. <laughs> not that. So, so this guy tells, he tells this rich man, I want you to donate matzahs for the entire Russian community. Oh, nice. Uh, guess the matzahs. So why would I donate matzahs? I got a shul. I can build a shul, something that's going to last. Matzahs, they'll eat the matzah, and that's it, finished, right? A good argument, right? The answer is that the rabbi says to him, first of all, when they eat the matzahs, they're fulfilling a mitzvah. A mitzvah's eternal. A mitzvah didn't go anywhere. A mitzvah's eternal. So you can't see it because you don't see a building like a shul. But they're lasting. The effects of the mitzvah are eternal, no different than a shul, number one. Number two, people who eat matzah, these people are going to have children. Children of people who eat matzah are going to be different than children who didn't eat matzah. That's also eternal. I mean, sometimes a person, one of the most difficult things to collect money for is to support Torah learners. There's a Gemara in Shkalim. The Gemara says they were walking, and one of the Amoraim said to the other one, my ancestors built a lot of shuls here. So the other one said to him, what, there weren't people learning Torah to support? That they had to go throw their money out on shuls? So people think, well, why would I want to support a guy learning in Kolo? He's going to learn today, and then it's gone. It's not gone. It's eternal. It's a different person has to have the right attitude here. It's not gone at all. It's the most important support is supporting Torah. So when you say, yeah, but you're giving to, what do you call it? You're giving to, 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 you're, to, to Hashem. Sure, Hashem's testing you. And I want to, to, to tell you something else. The ultimate test of your Jew, what did it say in the previous parsha? One of the commentary says, Moshe Rabbeinu comes down from the mountain, and the Jewish people said, Nasev and Ishma, on page 440. Right, Moshe comes down from the mountain, and the people said, Nasev and Ishma. Nasev, we're going to do, and we're going to, we'll, we'll carry out the Torah. So what's the first thing that comes right after that? So I would expect, you know, okay, let's see the laws of Tefillin, maybe uh, uh, how to daven, when to, when to say Kriya Shema, you know, uh, something about Borer on Shabbos. You know, give me some laws over here. What's the first thing the Torah does? Okay, let's see a donate. Nasa Venishma, as my father used to say, put your money where your religion is. Right? Let's see. Oh, Nasa Venishma, yeah, we're going to be from, we're going to do everything. Yeah, I don't want to hear about your gartel, and I don't want to see your shuckle. Put the cash on the table. We're building a mishkan. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not that from you know. I'm not an extremist. You know, I, you know, I, I'm a little more moderate. You know, no, 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 no. Cash on the table. Let's see it down on the table. That'll tell me if you're from or not. That's nasa v'nishmas fava. We'll do it. Oh yeah, you'll do it. Good. Put the money down. Put the money on the table. That'll determine whether you put it. That'll be the proof whether how religious you are. You really, guys got to buy a pair of tefillin. I was once in America years ago, years ago. There were two guys who were brothers. They were purchasers for a major, for a major department store. Both of them were millionaires, not religious. I was diving in the show with Sukkis. They knew my family. They were older guys. I was a young guy. I was just married. So I bought a Lulav and an Esrog in America. So they're sitting in show. They didn't have a Lulav and Esrog. One of them turns around and says, Hey, David. How much did that Lula and Estrog combination cost you? So I said, $39. He goes, Whew, boy, that's steep. And at 39 bucks, this guy pays 39 bucks. At the time, we're talking about 35 years ago, this guy paid 35 bucks for an entree in the restaurants he used to eat at. You know, 39 bucks, he whistles. Whew, ooh, that, I remember him whistling and she'll, Whew, boy, that's steep. And I think of myself, steep, you know, well, I use it for six days. It only comes out to six and a half bucks a day for the mitzvah. I don't think that's expensive for pay for a mitzvah. 
So you know, you're willing to pay for it. You're not willing to pay for it. That's what the, that's what Torah says. Let's see, let's see how let's see how dedicated you really are. That's why the Mishkan follows the donations for the Mishkan. Soliciting donations for the Mishkan follows. I told you a story. There's a shul. There's a shul. The rabbi gets up and he says to the congregants, "I got good news for you and bad news for you. We're building a new wing for the shul, and I've got good news and bad news. The good news is we already have the money. The bad news is it's in your pockets." <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's let's see. Okay, members of the shul, let's see how devoted you are. You know, the, the guy calls up a lawyer. The guy calls up a lawyer for the Jewish United Fund. He says, "Hey, Goldstein, uh, our records show that you earn over eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, and we haven't received a donation from you this year." He says, "Yeah, do your records also show that my brother's a wounded Vietnam veteran." Do your records also show my sister's a widow raising four kids on her own? Do your records also show that my mother is, is, is what he called my mother is not well and she's ill and she needs to be taken care of? And if they can't get a dime out of me, what makes you think you will? <laughs> so, so, you know, you know that, 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 that's, the, that's the great equalizer. Money's, money's the great equalizer here. So the Torah then says like this. There's a medrash. Okay, somebody else had a question. Ellie, did you have a question? Yeah, Shai? Yeah, go ahead. Um, with wives giving tzedakah, should the person, like the person giving tzedakah, should he give tzedakah to the wife as well? Like on a Wednesday, on a Thursday? Give it closer to when the poor man needs it. Well, if he's going to, he's going to give it to him on Monday, and he knows he's going to... And don't worry, he's hungry on Monday also. He'll, 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 well, I'm going to do you a favor and withhold the money till Friday. You know, sometimes you have to think about whether you should give him or not. A guy with a rusty needle who comes over to you and he says, he got a rusty needle dangling out of his arm. He says, hey, bro, can you spare a buck? You know, to get, him, get him some food. He needs a meal. But, but it, it, sometimes people want to do their mitzvah. Don't, just give him the money. You can give, we'll, we'll worry about Shabbos. You'll give him more money before Shabbos. How's that, Shia? You give him more money before Shabbos. Yeah. Somebody had a question. Yeah, go ahead. I had a question. What about like, uh, like donation from savings? Is percentage also count from savings or else only from the... Uh, Once you've given a good question, the way, the way t- tithing works is, first of all, you have to tithe your income after taxes. You don't have to pay, you know, your, your net. You have to tithe the net. But you have to tithe everything that you've, everything that you've earned. Once you've tithed it, you don't, have to, you don't have to tithe it again. It's, it's your earnings each year. So if you've got savings, you don't, have to, you don't have to tithe your savings. But if the savings are earning you money in the bank, the interest has to be tithed. Right? Besides your income, the interest has to be tithed, number one. Number two, there is a question of, uh, of merchandise. Uh, somebody once, they once saw Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, a very famous story. Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky was once walking into a, was once walking into a, uh, a, a, a silver shop. Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky was running the way there. They're walking into a silver shop. Nobody knew why is he going into a silver shop. So it turned out that somebody had given him a brand new Kiddush cup, a silver, a silver Kiddush cup. And he wanted to get it assessed, the value of the silver Kiddush cup, which apparently is very expensive, so that he could report it on his taxes. Instead of trying to try to hide it, you know, he was trying to try, trying to get the assessment so he could report it. That's as far as taxes. But money, tzedakah money, is after you pay after your taxes. What your net income has to be tithe. Your net income tithe. Then if you give twenty percent, uh, that's a it's a tremendous thing. Uh, yeah. So I was going to ask you something like that. Let's say somebody already received their obligated amount, 10, 10 20% of their money. Um, they don't have their savings. Should, and they had to have savings. Should they, if somebody's asking them in shul or knocking on their door for money, I think it's weird to not give them anything. Like You're, not only it's weird, you should, you, you should keep a running account. In other words, you could, you could get into the plus, you know, you, you could get into the plus, you know, I'm ahead a little bit, you know, and then, you, then, 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 you know, you keep a running account. You try to have some spare change around in order to give people to, to, to you know, give, because you see, you want to give most of it to a legitimate, well, to, 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 to a legitimate cause. Because there are a lot of guys, the Gemara says we have to be grateful to the tzedakah frauds. There are frauds, and we have to be grateful to the frauds. Why? Because if a person comes up after 120 years and Hashem says to him, why didn't you give more tzedakah? He says, listen, I don't want to give the frauds. So that's a, that's a fallback position. I would much rather after 120 years that they say to me, well, you gave a little too, you gave too much, not too little. Right? But that is a fallback position. So most of the money that you should give, you should give to 
a legitimate organization that you know is being run by pro, you know the people who are who know what they're doing. On the other hand, if you you should have a little bit of money to nickel and dime, you know, people come to the door. Most Jewish communities in America now, I think all Jewish communities in major cities, started in Baltimore. When somebody comes to collect door to door, you have to go to the VAD, to the rabbinic VAD of the community, and they check the guy out and give him some sort of identification to go door to door, uh, with uh, to go door to door asking for money because because there are people who are frauds. They're not you know they, everybody knows that Jews give. You know, there are Arabs who put on yarmulkes and come to the Jew. Why don't the Arabs go to the Arabs to collect? You know, they, they, you don't see Jews putting on kafias and going to collect by the Arabs. You know, Arabs put on yarmulkes and go go collect by the Jews. You know why? Why? Because they know that Jews give. So so there are frauds. You know, and you have to be uh, what you call it. Okay, I want to go on. I want to go. We'll talk about tzedakah. Uh, different. We spoke about tzedakah in the past. I just want to go on over here because there's so much to do here. The um, uh, uh, there's a medrash here that says on Vayikhuli Truma. The medrash quotes the pasuk. I have given you a good instruction. Do not forsake my Torah. And the Medrash triggers, it says, truma. Now this goes to your question. Uh, why are you giving it to God? It sounds like they should take for me, for God. right? So the Medrash says, why did it throw that? It could have also said, truma. they should take a truma. And they should take a donation. Why li? Wiley. So the Medrash says that when God gave the Torah, he said, take me along with it. I mean, I've given you my pre- most pre- precious gift. I've given you the Torah. Take me, God, along with the Torah. What does that mean? So the, uh, 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 the Medrash says that uh, there was, a, uh, there was a, uh, a boat. There were a bunch of merchants on a boat. And uh, there was one of the mer- one of the people on the boat was a Talmud Chacham, and these merchants said to him, they started they said, "Where's your merchandise?" He says, "My merchandise is worth more than your merchandise," and they were all laughing at him. He didn't have anything with him, and the boat then was attacked by pirates. The boat was taken by pirates, and they took all the merchandise. Then the people ended up on, finally pulled up to shore. When they pulled up to shore. So these guys had nothing. All these merchants were, were penniless. And this guy was a Talmud Chacham. He went into the base of Medrash, and he started giving a drusha. And people came. They honored him. They paid him everything else. They were supporting him. They gave him food. So eventually the other merchants came and said, hey, you know, can you intervene for us and get us some, get us some food? We're hungry. He says, I told you my merchandise is worth. What his, his merchandise was the Torah. His merchandise, he lekach tov it's the most precious merchandise. Torah, you know, we could take away from you. Nobody could take your Torah away from you. And your Torah is what you take with. A person dies, they take Torah and good deeds with them. That's all a person takes. All the money, all the gold, so that stays behind and your kids fight over it. Right? The, the Torah, the Torah that person, a person takes. Remember I told you that a man could come around and in, in, in a, a man could spend his whole life. It's one of the most chilling statements I've ever seen in the Gemara. You could spend your whole life accumulating material goods, money, wealth. Then the man dies and leaves it for... Who do you leave it for? That wouldn't be so bad. He could die and leave it for his wife's next husband. Yeah, that's bad. Yeah, that's bad. Guy, guy could spend like a whole lifetime. Yeah, how do you like that, Dylan? Yeah, think about that. You make a lot of money, and that guy who you could never stand, which is the guy your wife marries, he's got all your money. Remember what's his name? John Kerry the, uh, was running for vice president. For, for president. He, was, he became the, uh, he was the foreign minister. No good, Nick, with his fancy hair. Right? Who did he marry? He married Henrietta Heinz. You know who she was? You know the Heinz ketchup guy? He died. His wife married Gary. So all his money goes to pay for this guy's fancy hairstyle, his fancy hairdo, and his, and his unsuccessful presidential campaign. If Heinz knew that his wife would have, Heinz ketchup guy knew that his wife would marry this guy, she, he would have eaten mustard. Right? You know, that's what he spent his whole life accumulating money, just so this guy could go. This guy could go spending his money. So, yeah, what do you think? That is, what's it worth? Okay, you need your ba- you have your basic needs. You know, whatever, you, whatever, yeah, whatever a man's basic needs. What do you, but, but, but at the end of the day, number one, number two, I'll tell you an unbelievable medrash. This medrash brought down. You've heard there's a tractate called Chagiga. Maseches Chagiga. So the medrash says there was a man. There was a man who spent his entire life learning and reviewing Chagiga. He learned and reviewed Chagiga his entire life. 
What's that? What is Chagiga mean? It has to do with the, 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 the Korban Chagiga, the offering that's brought during the holiday. He learned his entire life in Medrash, learned Gemara Chagiga, kept reviewing it, reviewing it really good. One day the man died, and no one was around in the apartment where he died, in the home where he died. A woman showed up dressed in white, and she went to some of the people. She said, there's a man here, he died, and you, know, you, have, to, you have to honor this man. He learned Chagiga, you have to bury, he needs to be buried. So they buried this man, and then they were looking for this woman, and it turned out nobody could find her. The Medrash says she was the Neshama of Meseches Chagiga. Her name was Chagiga. She was the Neshama of the... What does that mean? A tractate in Shas has a Neshama. How do you like that? I don't think it's like our Neshamas. But there's a spiritual life to a tractate in Shas. And she learned Maseches Chagiga. I will tell you another. I'll tell you another incident. That's a medrash. I'll tell you an incident that happened. There was a kid in the yeshiva who was uh, in a regular regular yeshiva. The kid uh, started. He was. He started getting uh, losing his motivation. So he went over to the Russian yeshiva. He said, "I'm out of here. This is not for me. I'm not. I'm not interested in. Uh, I'm not interested in. This. Oh, one second. Let's back up. Back up. I started in the middle of the story. There was a guy." In, uh, in Yerushalayim in many years ago, he had one volume of Shas. They used to print Rosh Hashanah, Masachas Rosh Hashanah, and Beitzah in one volume of Shas. And that's the only volume that he owned. And he studied that volume over and over. And when he died, they wrote on his tombstone, he was buried one of the cemeteries here in Yerushalayim, and I think in Sfas, he was in Sfas. And they wrote on his tombstone, that here lies uh, Plony, who reviewed Rosh Hashanah and Beitzah 3,000 times. Yeah, 3,000 is a lot. 3,000 is a lot. You know, you know you're 10 tens, tens good. 3,000 is a lot. And it said on the tombstone he reviewed Rosh Hashanah and Beitzah 3,000 times. Okay, fast forward 100 years. And this bacher is in Yeshiva and he's unmotivated. And he leaves Yeshiva, he's not interested. And he leaves the Yeshiva and he drops out. About three weeks later, he resurfaces in the yeshiva, sits down at his table, and he starts learning. And he is learning, and he's learning like a house on fire. He comes back to the yeshiva, figures, okay, I'm not going to rock the boat, doesn't know what's happening. Comes back the second day, and there's the boy again, hitting the books morning to night, like a house on fire, not moving. Finally, the third day it's happening, it was a chazaka, three times is already a chazaka. The Rosh Hashiva walks over him, he says, hey, Yitzi, I mean, wh- what happened to you? You know, it's a, you never know, it could be drugs, yeah, who knows, you know, maybe he's on speed, who knows? He goes, hey, Yitzi, what, 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 what happened to you? You, know, you? you left here unmotivated, now you're now you're glued to the seat, what happened? He says, Rebbe, I'll tell you, I left the yeshiva. I was hanging around with my buddies. Well, we went around, we were in Yerushalayim, went down to Eilat, we were, we were hanging around, and then we went up to Tzvas. And when we were in Tzvas, we walked through the old cemetery in Tzvas. And I happened to look at a tombstone, and I see that on this tombstone it says, here lies Plony, who reviewed Rosh Hashanah and Beitza 3,000 times. I thought to myself, my goodness, there are people who take this stuff seriously. I said to my friend, Sayonara, I came back to Yeshiva and I'm not leaving. Right? That's the, that's ki lekach tov that's the importance of Torah. And nothing, nothing more important than Torah. So a person sees, in when Akash Baruch says, I gave you the Torah, take me with it. Take me with the Torah. Take, take, that's the ki lekach tov Okay, now, here's the raw material. Pasuk Gimel. Vezos ha-truma asher tikhu meitam. These are the donations. By the way, the word tikhu, also, by the way, the word tikhu, you know, there's a, the Gemara says in, in Baba Basra, Godol ha-me'ase yoser min ha Did you ever hear that saying? Godol ha-me'ase yoser min ha There are two aspects to, to, to tzedakah. There's giving and there's collecting. And it's a very big mitzvah to collect tzedakah. There are rules. You can't pressure people. You're not allowed to pressure people for tzedakah. You're not allowed to lay on a guilt trip. There, You can tell them a sob story. Anyway, but you can't pressure people, but it's a very big mitzvah to get people to do it. It's not, it's not fun, by the way. You know, not everybody is so happy to, to hear you soliciting money. The people who go around collecting for yeshivas, knocking and door, they always tell you you need two bags when you collect for a yeshiva. The, the, those who the fundraisers need two bags. There's a big bag and there's a little bag. The little bag is for the checks. 
The big bag is for the insults and the degradation. You know, you need a big bag for that. It's not an easy thing, but it's a tremendous, that's why the yichu, take it from people. That means you have to be willing to collect. The guy's like, gentlemen, I want to tell you something. One day, you're going to be members of a community. You know, in every community, you need a shul, you need a mikveh, you need a school, you need a, you know, there are a lot of needs in the community. People sit around waiting for somebody to do it. I remember when we used to go play basketball. So we go out on, you know, we go to the gym. You get about, you know, guys are hanging around. Hey, let's get a game. Well, guys, shoot, we're shooting around. Somebody, let, somebody make teams. Now, this guy's going to shoot around while somebody else makes it. Why don't you make teams? Why don't you do it? Right? Somebody says, why don't they build a show? Who's they? Why don't they build a shul? Why don't they build a make? Who's they? You're they, gentlemen. Guys who build shuls were not born, you know, they got a stamp on their forehead. The shul builder, right? The mikvah man, right? It doesn't work that way. Somebody saw a need, took the initiative, and it happened. Everybody has to know, you know, you're, all, you're as responsible as the next guy. You're as responsible as the next guy to get, the, to get, a, get a, you're a member of a community. You also got to step up to the plate. We all do. We're all part of a community. You can't wait for other people to do it. So the Torah says, this is what you're going to take. Good luck. Zav, v'kesef, v'nechoshes. Gold, silver, copper. Utcheles, v'argomen, v'solah, shoni, v'sheish, v'sheish, various, various materials. Now, where did they get all this stuff from? Where did they have gold? Where did they have silver from? Egyptians. The Egyptians. That strike you as strange? Let's build a shul. From what? From melted down Egyptian idols. Right? That's, like you're strange. That's what you're going to use for a shul? Contaminated money? Money that came from Egyptians? Why are you building a mishkan out of that? Why are you building with Egypt? Where else they get it? They were slaves. Where are they get it from? Why are you building? And, and it, this came from Egypt. What's the answer? To repurpose it and make something bad and something good. To re make part of it bad and something good. We could, we could, it, you're, you're certainly repurposing it, but why? What's, why do we should? That Kosh Rokha could have rained down gold on them. But he could bring down mana from heaven. He could bring down gold from heaven. As a matter of fact, we'll see what did come down from heaven. But the gold and silver and the copper, this all came from the Egyptians. Why? He, he wanted this and he gave them money and he wanted them to reuse it. Like it's just Why? Why does it have to be the Egyptian money? Why not my pure money from heaven? It's the same gold that can be used to worship idols, can be used to build a mission. Why? But good, it could be. But why should it be? You're right. You're right. You're right. And I'm right. You're all, we're all right. But why? You know, I told you. Oh, close. Very good. It's a sign of Hakora Satov. It's a reminder to us of our gratitude to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Every time you look at that Mishkan, remember where you came from. You were a slave. You were getting whipped. And in case you forget, we, it, remember, we do this in Judaism all the time. One of the things we say, well, we make Kiddush Friday night. What do we do? First of all, we declare that we're the best. We shamelessly declare that we're the we're the Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Ha'amim, which chose us from the, all the nations. And by the way, if you don't object, that means you're giving tacit approval. So if there are any any uh, uh, what do you call it uh, 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 any liberals who feel it's wrong, yeah, I'm not looking at you. <laughs> don't, don't worry. If there are any liberals who feel it wrong and it's racist and everything else, were you at a Friday night meal? Did you object? No, you didn't object. That means you approve. Well, I didn't object because I didn't understand the words. That's worse. You let people talk and say words they didn't understand. Maybe they're talking about you. And if you're a liberal, we would be, right? But uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we, we declare, uh, Hashem chose us, number one. What else? Zecher litzias mitzrayim, right? It, it commemorates having left Egypt. We're always talking about leaving Egypt. Come on, get past it already. We're out. <laughs> What's with the Egypt? Is? Yeah, that's exactly the point. Zecher litzias mitzrayim, because we say in the Pesach Seder, if Hashem wouldn't have taken us out, we'd still be there. It's not like with the, pa I always wondered, if you took an ice cube and put it in a freezer, and the freezer stayed frozen, it stayed at frozen, as one of great philosophical, uh, uh, my, my philosophical mental meanderings. Uh, if you took an ice cube and put it in a freezer, and the freezer stayed at frozen temperature for a thousand years, would the ice cube ever melt? Probably not. You know, you kind of go like, well, at some point I get, no. No, it wouldn't. It would stay frozen for a thousand years because that's what frozen means. We would have been in Egypt now. There was no slave, the manager says, no slave could escape from Egypt. No slave ever escaped from Egypt. How do you like that? No slave. They had magical creatures at every gate. 
They had the gate with dogs. So if a slave or anybody ever escaped out that day, gate, the magical dogs would start barking. So they knew which, uh, the security guys knew which gate to head for. If they went to Elephant Gate and Lion Gate and all the very, no slave ever escaped. All of a sudden, 600,000 Jews with sushi go marching out of Egypt, right? The matzah and sushi, right? And they go marching out of Egypt together. Hey, Moish, let's go. <laughs> and the Jews are going out. Where are you from? I'm from Goshen. Oh, do you know my cousin? Yeah, they, I'm sure they played Jewish geography when they met each other. That's also a tradition from our fathers. And they all go marching out. They all go marching out together. All the Jews go leaving Egypt together. Zecher litzias mitzrayim. We have to have gratitude to this day because otherwise we'd still be there. Therefore, they build a Mishkan out of these materials. As a reminder that this is what, what do you call it? This is, this is your reminder, you have to thank God for this. Now, if you take a look, there's something strange here. Look at Pesach Zion now. Avnei shoham ve'avnei miluim la'efod v'achoshen. There are shoham stones and miluim stones. These are various gemstones. On 444, two lines from the bottom, Pesach Zion. Avnei shoham ve'avnei miluim la'efod v'achoshen. You have the Shoham stones and you have the gemstones for the ephod and the Choshen. You know, look at the order. It starts gold. What's worth more, gold or silver? Gold. gold, silver, copper. Then you get to various materials. Pcheles, Argomon, Tolashon, Sheshiz, these are various fabrics. The Oros, Elim, Meodam, in various hides. And oil and spices. And then... Stones. I mean, stones are worth the most, aren't they? Maybe I don't know if they're worth more than gold. Let's go. But the stones are certainly worth more than they're certainly worth more than fabric. Why are the stones mentioned last? Avnei Shom, Avnei Milim. It's an interesting question. The stones are worth a lot. I like the Beatles more, but the stones are worth a lot too. So why why are the stones worth the most? Why are the stones over here put down? Where the actually I didn't like the stones. Why are the why are the stones put last over here? The precious. They didn't have the stones at the time. Oh. Where did it could? Where did they come from? Hashem had to uh, give them to him. Where did he give them to? How did he give them to him? Also, the uh, Nisim, the, oh. the leaders of the tribe, they were waiting to give last because they were going to. But where did they get the stones from? Uh, somewhere in the desert. Somewhere in the desert, yeah. Somewhere in the desert. Hey guys, let's go digging for stones. Some guy, by the way, found just recently a giant, uh, a giant diamond. There's a place in, I think, Arkansas. Mm-hmm. Is it in Arkansas? What's it called? And I, what am I doing here if there's such a place? That's what I was wondering. That was my next question. But there's a place in Arkansas where you get to go looking around, and once in a while, like once every 20 years, somebody finds a big diamond. So, you've been there? Yeah. What'd you find? Uh huh. Uh-huh. That's why he's here. <laughs> so maybe, maybe if you stay here, I'll go there. <laughs> so there's a place in, in Arkansas you go around, and this guy found a, he found a real big diamond recently. Okay, it wasn't me. But so, so, so where did they get the diamonds over here? It wasn't Ar- They weren't in Arkansas. They like, magically went to Arkansas. No. What it says is when the Nisim, the Tzadikim, when the manna came down from heaven, with the manna for certain people came gemstones. It's like the it's like the Cracker Jacks box, you know. You used to, used to get a, used to get a prize in the Cracker Jacks. I mean, let's face it, guys, the Cracker Jacks just weren't that good, right? The the the, the popcorn was a little bit a little bit kind of kind of the chocolate the, 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 the caramel was a little bit what do you call it? The, the peanuts were a little bit burnt, but the prize, you know, you bought a Cracker Jack for a prize, like the prize of the cereal boxes. So you came down the money in heaven, and for certain people, the money came down with gemstones. Oh, now we know why they're last. It didn't take any effort to bring gemstones. Yeah, I dropped it at my door. You brought it to the base of me. HaKosh Baruch wants to see the effort. HaKosh Baruch wants to see that you're giving something that you had to work for, you had to produce, you had to do something for. Okay, they found, they asked it from Mitzrayim, they asked it. But there was a little bit of human endeavor in getting the, accumulating the other stuff. What counts in Avodah Hashem is Look, if it's easy for you to go to shul, you got to go to shul anyway. But there's something called the effort. It's the effort that counts. I want to see some effort, some energy, and I can't just do the easy stuff. We have to do, we have to make the effort. And therefore, the Mephorshim would say the gemstones are mentioned last. Because then the Siam brought it, okay, it fell at my doorstep. So you pick it up and you bring it to the base of Migdash. Not that it's easy to donate the gemstones, but it didn't take any energy 
whereas everything else did. Therefore, the Torah says, they have, they, they, the first would say, that goes last. One more pasuk. Ve'asuli mikdash ve'shachanti besochem. They shall make a mikdash for me, and I will dwell among them. And this, many commentaries say, ve'asuli mikdash, they shall make a mikdash. Now, it shouldn't say, and I will dwell where? How, in Hebrew, how would you say, ve'asuli mikdash, they shall make for me a mikdash ve'shachanti. What should the next word be? What? What? Biso. Bisocho. It shall make a mikdash, I will dwell in it. Why does it say I will dwell in them? Your brother, mikdash is singular. Why should I why should it say bisocham? The answer is should dwell inside each Jew. Each Jew should make himself a mikdash. We have to purify our hearts, say that Akkadish Rochu dwells in each and every one of us. That's one of the answers that Mepharshim gives. There's another answer. Who's going to design this thing? Who's going to make this mikdash? Huh? Okay, among others. Yeah. When did they go to architectural school? I was like, go design a mikdash with some pretty elaborate stuff over here. When did they go get these, uh, when did they take these courses? They learned a lot of building. There's a, a good, a good. There's something quite different about building pyramids than going and doing very, very fancy needlework on uh, on what it goes. Not a bad answer. It could be, you know, a little bit of the skills. It's interesting. The Torah says every Jew has to build a sukkah. You know, every guy who's learning in kolel, where about the heaviest thing you've lifted is a baba basra. You know, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden, you got to go start carrying two by fours, and you got to start. What do you call it? And figuring out how to structure. I, I was never good at it. Uh, you got to build. My brother, my brother could, could, you know, he built a door. He he spent a half a day building a door with a so that the, as you close the door, the lock would automatically close. He was so proud of himself. You know, you slant, close the door, and dink, and the lock went. And he was just uh, happy as a lark. You know. And, but he did it. He decided, you know, I, for me, I got better. You know, I wouldn't spend that much time. I would spend time breaking the lock, not, not building the lock. But he, you know, and then he, you got to build it up, and guys are measuring and building and knocking stuff, nails. And uh, where did you learn these skills? Where did you get these skills? The answer is, yeah, you can figure it out. You figure it out. V'shachanti yeah. b'sochem, not in the Mishka. Nothing to figure out over here. This is too articulate, too elaborate. Too elaborate. V'shachanti b'sochem. I'll put my dwelling, I'll put my shechina, my divine presence, in the builders so that the builders will then succeed in building the Mishkan. Okay, TBC. Gentlemen, don't forget, 1210 instead of 1215.